everybody, Christine McDaniel here with the Co-Living Code Show. Really excited. I have Jay Standish here. He's with Open Door, and this guy is like a veteran in the game. And it was so cool because I just randomly reached out. I didn't know him personally. I'm like, hey, Jay, is there any way you want to be on my show? He said, yeah, of course. And I was stoked because, again, he's been in the game since 2013, five years um, he will talk about, I, I do believe you coined the term uh, co-living, so props to that. <laughs> I didn't personally, but the, the, there was a crew in San Francisco during our time of getting going that I think that's when the coin. I love it. I love it. And so it, he's been, it, he's up in the Bay Area, and then they just opened up Portland. Um, they've got five different properties. They've got three um, getting ready to open up in the next like four months, roughly. Uh, so they've got some fast growth. It's an amazing concept. He's all about community and the sharing economy, which we all love, right? So uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and kind of take us back five years, right? When you wanted to start this. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, when we started the company, uh, really co-living didn't, didn't exist as a concept in the way that it's currently being kind of described and developed. Um, obviously, various forms of community living and intentional community has existed since humans uh, came out of the primordial soup. But um, yeah, we were just really, it started out uh, actually out of a grad school project um, up in Seattle. And my friend and I, who's now my co-founder, um, we really just wanted to live in community ourselves and had found a group called the Embassy in San Francisco that was doing a really beautiful mansion in the Lower Haight in San Francisco. And so we kind of shadowed them as a project and then we're like, hey, we want to do this too, and decided to move to the Bay Area, started our own house in Berkeley. And then from that, like two months after starting our first house, like CNN was on the doorstep and we're like okay there's something going on here um so from there you know we kind of put together an llc and really kind of bootstrapped the company in the first i don't know two years or something we we went and mass released a project um called the farmhouse in berkeley that's like a beautiful 16 bedroom victorian um and then we bought a building with some investors and renovated it um called the canopy um and then the third project we kind of became property manager. So as we were going, we were kind of figuring out what's the right um, way to structure things on the real estate side and, and sort of the business model, so to speak. I mean, I think the business model was obviously just kind of being a landlord and renting rooms and getting a margin on that, but like how you actually structure that. Um, and also just starting out as a, as a company that didn't have a huge amount of backing, you know, there wasn't, we weren't taking on VC capital or didn't have personal, you know, balance sheets to throw at it. So we kind of built it from the ground up and then um, a couple of years in raised a little bit of friends and family money um, and really have been kind of growing organically and just doing really good projects. Our focus has always been, you know, only doing the projects that actually make sense financially and not getting overextended um, and really focusing on getting the community right. And, um, and really that there was something kind of, to be developed uh, and to be matured in, in how the communities are run and, and doing a couple really well so that you know where all, where all the kinks could be um, and how to do it right. And then we've kind of gotten there and now we, we know, um, I think, how to grow responsibly and, and make sure that all of our projects are really amazing from a community experience standpoint where you know the goal is that someone living in one of these houses, it's like actually one of the most impactful experiences in their lives. Um, so that's so cool. And you live, you said since day one, you've lived in the concept all five years, right? Yeah. I lived in our first house, which was only really around for a year. We kind of like personally leased it in our own names. And then <clears throat> when that closed down, moved over to uh, a house called Euclid Manor that I'm in right now. And I've been in this house for maybe three and a half years, something like that. Um, that's so cool. And does your co-founder, does he also live in the concept? Yeah, we've lived together the whole time. Oh, that's awesome. So, oh my yeah, gosh. We are, we, we eat our own dog food. We, uh, we, we live, live the, uh, live the dream together. So 
That's yeah. so cool. And you, you know, you'd said this before we, we turned on the recording and got started is that you guys from every aspect of the business, like you guys are personally involved, right? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, when we started, obviously co-living didn't really exist and we had to figure out how to get the concept, give it traction and, and, and make it happen. Um, and we weren't coming from a real estate background. We were really coming from create the community experience and, and the um, lifestyle that people want, and then backed ourselves into learning a lot about real estate. Um, so, you know, we, at this point now we're doing, we're, we're acting as developer on some of our projects, although most of them we're partnering with developers and investors um, and really serving as a property manager. But yeah, I mean, we we're very deep in culture and community and kind of um, systems in the house for kind of self-organization really like to think of the community as, as an empowered group of people who can solve their own problems and come up with their own systems. And so every house is a little bit different. It's kind of like uh, things evolve from, from the initial DNA that, that gets set up and then the houses will change, you know, how they do chores or how they do decision-making um, or, you know, what kinds of events they have and, and what people care about in the house, depending on the people that are there. Um, so yeah, very deep in the culture and sort of the systems of, of how to run houses really well. Um, and then obviously kind of the property management is at the core of the business in terms of renting out rooms, making repairs, you know, setting up the, the contracts well, um, just like coordinating the operations. Um, and then actually a lot of our work is really at the real estate level in terms of development, um, of either doing our own deals or even when they're deals with partners, we still do a lot of underwriting and sort of concept design um, on the projects and are pretty highly involved, even in like material selections uh, for projects that we don't own, but are gonna be managing. So um, yeah, and you know, we've done, had to deal with entitlements and getting zoning permits and um, getting bank loans and explaining things to all the various authorities that are involved. So. Pretty much anything involved in co-living we've we've personally touched and also the, the company is involved in. Because how close in the Bay Area, how close are you to actually the city? Because I know San Francisco has some uh, very unique rules on co-living. <laughs> yeah, we have projects in Oakland, Berkeley, and San Francisco. Um, so, um, yeah, we're pretty familiar with the, the zoning and the use kind of guidelines in all of those cities. And Berkeley and San Francisco in particular are kind of infamous for being yes. just generally for housing. There's like a lot of regulation. Um, so, and to add co-living on top of that is a lot, but yeah, I mean, the city of San Francisco, we've been in con conversation with for many years um, and are on kind of advisory committee for the zoning department on um, how to create a co-living forward um, kind of use permit. Are they receptive to that? That's really good to hear that you guys are Yeah, I mean, it, takes, it takes time, but they're looking at it. And, um, you know, it just depends on the city. That's part of why we're in Portland is that there's like really creative um, housing policy there and pretty permissive of interesting new uses. Um, and there's also like lower parking restrictions. It's very like bike and transit forward city so um can do more interesting projects in portland and it's just kind of i think the right culture as well so. for sure are you going to move once you guys have you lived up there at all or are you going to stay in the bay area um i went up there for about six weeks when we were first getting going in portland um and i used to live in seattle uh for many years so have some friends there and stuff um but we kind of go back and forth and you know eventually we'll get some we'll get a team member on the ground there but uh Probably not until we have like three new projects that are being built right now in Portland. Um, so I think as we get closer to those launching, we'll uh, we'll be more involved. Nice. And then, what's your guys' average stay at your homes? Pretty long. So yeah, we def we did guest stays the early days when we were kind of bootstrapping and you know trying to make cash. Um, and also, it was kind of an interesting cultural experience of new people coming in and spreading the word. Um, but nowadays, uh, yeah, it's, it's all long-term. We sign long-term leases. So the, the average length of stay is like, you know, 19 months or something like that. Um, it's hard, to, it's kind of hard to measure because we have people who've literally been in the houses for 
four, four and a half years, three years. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's in the, it's in the sort of two years range. Um, is it a one, is it a one year minimum or six month minimum? It's a one year minimum. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. And that's to help build community, obviously, right? Yeah, you know, real kind of buy-in and, and sort of investment and ownership on the sort of social level of people getting to know each other really well. And I think it makes the community a lot more coherent and sort of stable over time. If you have a relatively um, consistent cast of characters that get to know each other and each other's quirks and communication styles and um, is able to develop kind of that sense of chosen family in the space. And then what's like the age range and is it mostly guys or girls or is it split up? Does it depend on the house? Yeah, so all of our houses are pretty gender balanced. Um, usually like dead on. Um, and the age range is basically, we say 25 to 35 is like the core of it. Um, you know, there might be some people in their early 20s, some people in their late 30s. This house, Euclid, that I live in is more like early 30s to late 30s, just happens to be the group. Um, and, uh, you know, but yeah, sometimes people, when, every occasionally in their early 40s, we had a family just move out of here that actually had a baby here uh, while living in Euclid. And, you know, they were, they were like, I think 38 and 40 or something like that, had, had a baby late in life. Um, and uh, yeah, that was our first child. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That's awesome. No, because people ask all the time. So did that change the dynamic of the home? Uh, not really, honestly, a little bit. Um, you know, we lucked out the kid was like really cool and mellow. I think that's a huge part of it. Um, I think there's a couple people in the house that were like, felt like more impacted <laughs> by it than others. but um yeah for the most part it was fine and we kind of knew that they were going to move out once he started walking which I think went a little bit longer than they had anticipated but we were all like I don't know it seems fine like you've got you know 10 aunts and uncles looking after him all the time it's, he's not going to run into anything so oh uh, that's so cool <laughs> that's yeah. awesome and then what's the so how many people live I guess it depends on the house but like which house has the most amount of people living in it roughly um, in general, like we found that under 15 is kind of a good number, but a uh, farmhouse I think has 20 because there's a number of couples there. Um, but it's over the years, we've kind of noticed it's like a little big, um, cause even 10, I think is a good size co-living house. Um, so to be twice that is kind of a lot. Um, so yeah, we try to try to keep it under 15 if we can. Cool. And then what's your favorite part about, um, I mean, again, you've been doing it for a while. So what do you love most about running a co-living concept? Well, the cool thing is, I mean, there's, you get to have a mix. First of all, it's just the variety. So I get to be involved in finance, you know, construction. I was, I have boots on right now. Like I was just like <laughs> construction site, like out there, like figuring out, you know, what materials were going to go in the kitchen and what the timeline is for the framing to go up and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, get to be involved in physical design and thinking about the space layout. And also like, you know, it's really cool to be doing new construction because when we first started, we're like, ah, I wish this breakfast nook was over here. Or, you know, it's really weird layout that the dining room is like this. And now we get to learn from all of the kind of experience that we have using the spaces and be like we need us we need two dishwashers two stoves two fridges and like design the kitchen actually to already have that not just hack it in um so yeah the design part's really fun um but then like i'd say the most rewarding thing is just the people um and living in the houses particularly like i think with any kind of like big project or organization or endeavor or mission or startup, you know, there's this sense of like delayed gratification as well as like, you know, when are we really going to make the impact or when are we going to kind of paint our masterpiece? And the cool thing about this is like, you get to kind of reap the rewards on a daily basis just by like dinner parties happening and music nights and like people having really profound conversations and seeing the relationships that build and, 
you know, really actually seeing it make a difference in people's lives is, is super rewarding. So. That is super cool. Okay. No, I love that. And then what, no, I love that you touched on the two dishwashers, the two sinks and you're right. Cause every house it's like, Oh, we wish this was a little different. Um, and then we've talked with other co-living operators where the dishes like, so you guys have, do you guys split the chores equally? You know, cause dishes in every co-living concept, every single one, it's always like, okay, who's doing the dishes? What's going on? There's dishes all in the sink. Um, how do you guys well, kind of facilitate some of those chores? Well, in general chores and a lot of other house systems are at the level of the community themselves for the system that they want to use. We have like a variety of kind of templates or ideas that we kind of hand over and say, you can try these different options. Um, but there's only one rule that at the social level we dictate from the open door level across all the houses. And that is no dishes in the sink ever. <laughs> Clean or dirty. Um, so it's like, and we super emphasize that as the house is getting built up is literally just the, the dishes in the sink. Um, that it's like similar to a relationship. I don't know what the analogy would be, but you know, spending quality time together or whatever is like, if you take care of the dishes, like the rest of it, you know, it's like an indicator for the health of the relationship, so. Nice, I like that. Cause even we have somebody that comes in to do our dishes every day, you know, to that's like a concierge doing it for us and I still see dishes in the sink during the middle of the day. And I'm like, <laughs> we have like, we're so spoiled. We have somebody doing it and there's still dishes in the sink. Uh, but what's funny is every single person, same issue. Every concept I've talked to, um, yeah. But you guys are saying that was, that's like the one thing. It's like no. Totally. Yeah. I mean, actually in the three, the three houses, the, our first three houses, none of them have had or have professional cleaners come. Everything's done by the houses. And I think if you walked in, you would assume that there were professional cleaners involved, wow. just very tidy. And you create the culture the right way. Like people take care of it and are really involved and have a sense of ownership. And, um, yeah, I remember being at a party actually at the farmhouse and it's a party cause there's, you know, there's like random people showing up and they don't necessarily know that I'm like the landlord. Um, and they're like, man, this is the cleanest co-op I've ever been to. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty cool. Huh? It's like, like, yeah. And like the furniture is like super like stylish, but also feels like authentic and real. And it's not like, it's just like great. I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, what is this? Like, just like pretended to not be, you know, um, so yeah, I think, I think all of these things kind of weave together, but the social experience is the foundation from which everything is, um, is built. And then talking about systems, which you mentioned, do you guys have software? Like how, what's managing all this stuff? Yeah, we've kind of glued together a bunch of off the shelf, modern kind of SaaS software, um, using APIs and stuff like that, that you know, rather than having like a custom built piece of software, um, we've reused stuff that people have already built and just kind of glued it together. Oh, cool. Just hacked it. That's kind of what we're doing. We're, we're, <laughs> well, we're building our software now for everybody because I'm blown away that this space has no software yet. Um, yeah. So we're, we're really, really early days. I mean, we had spec'd it out and, you know, talking to kind of VCs in the Bay Area, they're like, well, could you like slap some software on it? And then maybe it might be more of a VC thing. We're like, no, um, it's not really necessary yet because at the time there were, wasn't enough co-living stuff happening. We're like, there isn't a big enough market. Like if you just were going to build a piece of software to manage co-living houses at the time, it was like, well, we could, we could use it and like campus could use it. And this yeah. random house in Bulgaria could use it and that's about yes. it. Um, but now I think there's actually enough to, you could, build a piece of software and, and sell it to all the various operators out there. Yeah, because the they, people are doing their own in-house thing as well and stuff like that. So because you have because you have different pieces that are still having to talk to each other, right? It's not like all in one. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Cool. Yeah. For the booking and all that. Um cool. Got it. No. And that was my thing. I was like, I don't know how the how you guys are doing this. Um, with that many beds that you guys are running, that many locations, but yeah, so hopefully it is well received. But I thought there was already software out there, and everybody asked was like, nope. And the real big players, like We Live and all of them, they have their own, obviously. 
um, custom built solution. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so my last question for you, Jay, is where do you see, and again, it's so cool because you've been doing this for five years, you've seen five years worth already, like where do you see the future of co-living as an entire industry? Totally. Well, I'd say there's kind of two big pieces. One is, you know, everything heading toward basically an institutional asset class. Um, so... Yeah, when we started, it was more like convincing developers that co-living was a concept that was worth doing, as well as this tiny company called Open Door. Um, and now it's more like, we'll start the conversations. They already know what co-living is. And they're like, cool, how are you guys different? And we're like, wow, this is a totally different conversation than what we were having two or three years ago. Because uh, we were sort of like the only person they were talking to then. And now they're like, cool, well, we're talking to three different operators. We're like, okay, interesting. Um, so, yeah, we're already seeing, obviously, a lot more people do co-living, and um, it's becoming, I think, quite um, well-known in the real estate world. And so the more deals that happen, <clears throat> um, the bigger deals are able to be, because um, you, you're building comps, and then people go at risk and kind of put their chin out and do a bigger deal. Um, but we need to see some of those bigger deals get traded and, and sold so that there's um, starting to be comps on what the sort of like exit cap rates are on like a larger co-living project. It might be slightly sub, sub institutional, it might be like 50 bedrooms or 100 bedrooms. <clears throat> uh, and then you start seeing some of these projects, I think like, like Ollie's doing that are like 300 bedrooms. That's like more properly an institutional size deal. But a lot of times they're slicing out like 30% of, excuse me, like 30% of one of those larger deals to be actually co-living. And then the other parts just like traditional multifamily. So they're not actually going at risk, as at risk on doing kind of a off piece product type. Um, so there's the institutional thing. And then um, I think the other piece is like broadening to other demographics beyond essentially like upwardly mobile primary city millennials that are like in the creative class and like digital nomads um, to f small families. I think the two biggest demographics are probably small families and empty nesters and sort of people that are early retirement um, and are looking for community in that stage of life. Um, there's already like kind of a pretty budding organic co-housing scene of people who are in their sort of 60s who self-develop a co-housing project. My mom is actually doing one in Connecticut. It's like 30 units that they're just doing themselves um, to live in community, but have their own units. Um, so I think we'll see different sort of unit layouts as well as like demographics that are doing some kind of community living. But I think the big, you know, big distinction of like what's co-living as this like kind of new idea versus there's always been people living in co-ops or intentional communities is that the projects are being professionally managed and developed and there's, you know, actual kind of like companies behind it. Um, because really up until recently there, there's no developers building for community, a community living concept. Um, and so that's kind of, I think part of what's new about co-living, but it's, it's also, I think a second, a new wave of interest in community living that has broader appeal um, that's kind of beyond the Berkeley granola scene and is sort of like, yeah, a, a more kind of quite say mainstream, but pretty mainstream demographic of people that are, that are interested in it. Um, and I think that's partially a generational thing um, among millennials, but I think it's also a broader societal shift that I think people, there's a loneliness epidemic and people are craving deeper relationships um and actually there's been a latent desire for a community that now finally kind of real estate developers are um building for so yay no and i'm so glad you touched on that because i agree 100 percent um so it sounds like you're more you're excited because there's some people on the fence where they're like oh let's take it let's keep it more wholesome and you know berkeley granola like you said and then there's the people that are more taking it more commercial more mainstream so like does that part excite like to me i love that because it gets the concept out to more people 
Yeah. Um, so that's the side of the fence you're more on is just kind of, again, and you've been doing it for five years, so you've seen it all. Yeah. I mean, I would actually put it, make it a yes and. Um, I don't okay. actually think that the authenticity of the community and the scale of the project are mutually exclusive. Um, and that's kind of the, the needle that we're trying to thread, which is maintain really strong cultural kind of stickiness and quality um, while starting to do bigger projects and have them be kind of like really tight, um, you know, institutional quality real estate deals. Um, so that's kind of what we're all about is we always kind of go back to the core foundation of ultimately people are choosing this lifestyle and so you need to have a good social experience for those people. Otherwise, it's going to devolve into like a flop house. And so you, you do need quality, authentic culture. And you need to do the deals really well. And, and there's actually a lot of synergy in terms of how you design the physical space, how you design the operations, how you curate community to be able to kind of have all of those things cohesively come together. Um, so that's kind of what we've been up to and, and part of why we've taken a little a little while to kind of craft it and work on it at a decently small st scale so that we understand how all these systems tie in together. And now we're kind of, you know, stepping into to growing that. I love that. And then is there, um, is there any newer concepts that you see popping up that, you, that you're personally a fan of? Like, hey, I really like what they're out there doing. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always been excited about the kind of network um, model uh, actually early days when we were first kind of brainstorming this that was part of the vision was like oh let's create this network of co-living spaces and you can have a membership to the network and kind of bop around and go anywhere um, and then we kind of like ah, we'll have to like figure out how to do legal and in like Indonesia and like that just sounds crazy like let's just get a bunch of projects here going and like see where it goes from there um, but I do think it's a cool idea um, and yeah, I mean, I think one curiosity and interest of ours has always been at the ownership level. Um, so continue to be curious about um, things that are playing around with sort of fractional ownership or um, the ability for the, the residents to, to get a piece of the pie in terms of equity in the deals. Um, I, I think that stuff like that will eventually be popping up. Um, there's obviously been a lot of movement on real estate crowdfunding kind of like independent of co-living. Um, I think, uh, I believe that Star City crowdfunded a deal using a crowdfunding platform. Um, so that's, but I think, I think they pair well. I think they're yeah. all part of the same kind of future vision that we're, we're living into. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, Jay, thank you so much. I know you're a busy guy. It's like you're coming off of a, of a construction site, you know, on one of your projects and to do this interview. But again, it's just so helpful in getting the word out about co-living and you're awesome. Absolutely. Forever yeah. in LA, let me know. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm sure I'll be down there. Okay, cool. Thanks again. Have yeah, a good thank day. You. All right. Take care.